Have you ever had someone forgive you? And I mean, see you for who you are truly, and yet forgive you 100%. If you've experienced that, you know how freeing and how amazing that is to have real forgiveness. I've experienced that many times, um, especially with my wife, right? We, we all sin against those who are closest to. My wife, Laura, has forgiven me so many times. But do you have forgiveness with God? Do you know that God forgives your sins? Is, is the thought of God forgiving you even possible in your mind? Can it, could a perfect, holy God who created everything actually forgive us for the evil things that we've done? If you don't have forgiveness from God, then nothing else matters. And if you do have forgiveness from God, then nothing else can be a threat to your safety because in the end, everything is going to be all right. If you have forgiveness from God, nothing else is a problem by comparison because God will fix every problem if he can fix the greatest problems. Or in other words, if, if God can handle our biggest problems, then he can handle everything else as well. And there's no greater problem that we have than our own guilt because of sin. So are you struggling with the weight of guilt right now? Are you struggling with depression? Well, then this psalm is for you, and I hope it'll be so freeing. This is an incredible, amazing psalm. So let's jump into it. The first section we see is verses one and two, and we see the blessing of forgiveness. The blessing of forgiveness. Let me read these verses. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. The way this psalm starts is so powerful, right? It starts with that word, blessed. Blessed. These are the same, same word that, well, this is in Hebrew, but in Greek, it's this equivalent word that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount when he stands up and he says, blessed over and over and over again. This word means essentially happy. That, that often sounds too weak for us, but the idea is if you're blessed, then you have joy, you have satisfaction, you have what you need. And so he says, blessed is the one this is the, like the start of the entire book of Psalms. Remember Psalm 1, we saw it start that way, right? Blessed is the man, and it talks about who doesn't walk in wickedness, but walks according to the law of God. This is the way to blessing. And so we saw the entire book of Psalms is framed by that idea. But here, he doesn't say blessed is the one who obeys God. He says blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven, Blessed is the one who is forgiven. Now, notice he, he uses three different words for sin. Um, some may be unfamiliar for you, but these three words are all synonyms for sin, and they're the three main words for sin in the Old Testament. So he uses the word transgression first, then sin, and then iniquity. So those three words, that's like your your comprehensive vocabulary of sin, at least typically how it's used in the Old Testament. Um, but what's really interesting here are the verbs that he uses in regards to that sin. So he says, first, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Forgiven means it's lifted or it's removed. That's kind of the idea of forgiven. It's been dealt with. Uh, second, he uses the, the verb covered, right? Blessed is the one whose sin is covered. What he means by that is something that's covered is something that is kept from sight. Now, this doesn't mean that it's it's simply ignored or just buried, but the idea is that, because it's been dealt with by the word forgiven, right, where it's been removed, but something being covered means that God doesn't look at our sin anymore, that really God can't look at our sin anymore because it's been forgiven, it's been put away, it's been covered so that he'll never remember it anymore. And then we see, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. So here, that the language is that the sin simply isn't counted anymore. It's not credited to our account, so to speak. And this reminds us of Genesis 15, 6, which is a verse that is so important in the scriptures, it's hard to exaggerate, where it talks about Abraham and his belief in God. And it says this, Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. So that idea of being counted is the same idea from Psalm 32, 
being counted as righteousness means that something that was not in his account, not in his to his credit, is given to his credit. So this is this is very interesting. So the good news, in other words, is that we don't have uh, we don't have our own sins credited to our account, but instead we have righteousness credited to our account. This is the idea of justification. Justification. You know, I often when I was a kid, I, I would get confused about what it means that we are righteous because I would hear that we're declared righteous by God, but then I would sin and I would think, well, does that mean I'm, I've am i undone that righteousness because I'm obviously not living in a righteous way if I just sinned? And so my logic was correct. I was just missing what it means for us to be counted righteous in God's eyes. It doesn't mean that we are actually righteous right now, that everything that we do is right. What it means is that God credits righteousness to our account. He doesn't credit us with the sins that we've committed. And instead, he gives us righteousness from Jesus Christ. In other words, this is sort of a, an accounting or a legal thing is the right way to look at it, right? It's a legal reality that we are not charged with a crime because of our sins. And instead, we're given credit for all the righteous deeds of Jesus Christ. That's what justification speaks to. And he says, last in, the, in verse two, he says, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So the first three phrases, they're, they're all paralleled, right? They're saying, blessed are the ones whose sins are forgiven. And then the last phrase is something different. It, it's, this is key, though. It, it, it moves from the state of the person to how they're acting, how they're engaging. They don't have any deceit in their heart. And this was really a hinge to the next section because deceit is a key idea here. Deceit is, in this context, denying that you've sinned or that your sin is a real problem that keeps you from God or that deserves judgment. And so if you have deceit, if you keep the truth from God, you're not going to receive forgiveness. Now, why would someone choose deceit over truth when it comes to their sin? <clears throat> well, there's a few reasons, right? One is just fear. Often we're afraid to be honest. We're afraid of God and how he'll respond to our sin, that he won't forgive us or that he'll punish us, or we're afraid of other people. We're afraid that someone's going to know that we're sinful. And so instead of being honest, we hide within lies. Maybe we choose deceit simply because we love our sin. We're more committed to our sin and we love it more than we love God. That's another possibility. Another possibility is pride. Maybe you don't want to tarnish your reputation. Maybe you don't want to tarnish your reputation even in your own mind. That's you, you so, You're so prideful that you don't even want to just in your own heart face the reality that you are a sinner and that you deserve God's judgment. There, there are many reasons why we would choose deceit over truth, but all those reasons are bad reasons. They don't give to us anything that we're actually looking for, and ultimately they're destructive. And that leads us to the next section, which is verses three to five, the experience of forgiveness, the experience of forgiveness. So having told us that you're blessed if you're forgiven, David here wants to give us an example of this, make it more tangible. And so he recounts here an experience that he had hiding his sin from God and the results that came from it. And then finally, he confesses and receives forgiveness from his sin. Verse three, he says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. He says, when I kept silent. So, th so this, what's to follow refers to a time where he was in a state of deceit. Deceit. He was, he was lying about his sin. He was refusing to acknowledge his sin before God and to repent from it. And there's a real impact to this. We see the, the results in David's life. We see first decay. There's decay. He says, my bones are, were wasting away. His bones refers to his inner being, to the kind of deepest part of his physical being. And it refers to his vitality being sapped away. He's, he's decaying. We see depression. He says, I was, he was groaning all day long. Groaning is an outward expression of an inward burden. And so he reveals his inward state of suffering and depression by groaning. And it's a constant groaning. It's all day long. What he's going through is ruining him and it's, ru it's consuming him constantly. 
And then we can also see God's disapproval in his life. So we see decay, depression, and then disapproval in his life. Verse four, it says, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. This is, this is the most fearful thing, that God would be displeased with you, that God would hate you or reject you because of your sin. And yet this is what David is experiencing. He's experiencing God's hand weighing on him, being heavy on him. This speaks to his awareness that he is sinful and should repent. And God is making his life miserable and uncomfortable. And then last we see disintegration. His strength is dried up. He doesn't have any more strength. So he's he's showing us through this depiction here that sin has consequences. Sin affects us at every level of our being. One of the great lies being told today that we often believe is that sin doesn't have consequences. It's the same lie as the very first lie that we hear in scripture in Genesis 3, 4, where the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Remember in context, God had told Adam and Eve that if they ate the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge, good and evil, that they would die. Here the serpent says, you're not going to die. No, you're not going to die. Do you get what the lie is? It's very simple. It's very straightforward. It's that you won't face any consequences for your sins. That there's nothing bad on the other side of sin. That your sin, the sin that you have, it doesn't hurt anyone. It's not a big deal. It's not going to affect anyone. So why does it matter? And yet how much misery has been called by that, caused by that one simple, seemingly insignificant lie that you will not surely die. No, it's not true. David shows us he, he's decaying on the inside and the outside. He's depressed. His soul, his, his spirit, his emotions, his body, everything is out of joint because he's hiding in his sin. And maybe a greater lie has been that once you have sinned, you can fix it on your own. It's, it's crazy, but we often think that, well, I can handle this. I can do something about my sin. I can make myself better. But it's impossible to fix our sins because we're the one who got ourselves into the mess. And so we don't have the strength to get ourselves out of the mess. We're the one who caused the problem. We need someone greater than us to fix the problem. And no matter how many good things you do, it'll never overcome or change the bad things that you've done. That's not how morality works. Instead, we should confess to God. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. These are fixed laws in the universe. If you hide your sin, if you try to hide it from God, you will not prosper. You can't. But praise God, there's mercy available. If you just will confess it and turn from it, God is waiting and ready to forgive you. And so David finally decides to confess his sin. Verse five, he says, I acknowledge my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin, Selah. Notice his actions here. He acknowledged it. Sometimes what we need simply is just to come to grips with the fact that we have sinned, to acknowledge it. Uh, Augustine said, the beginning of knowledge is to know oneself to be a sinner. So if you want, you want to know yourself and you want to know things, right? If you just want to have general knowledge, it starts with knowing that you are not enough that you are sinful, that you have done things that have offended the God of the universe. So first he acknowledges his sin. And then it says, he says he did not cover his iniquity. Notice he's using all the same words again. He uses in verse one and two, right? Sin, iniquity, and transgressions. But he doesn't cover his iniquity. So he, he made a choice not to hide that reality anymore and to be honest with God. And then he confesses. This is a confession, not just that he has done something, but it's a confession of who he is that he's unworthy and undeserving. And so he acknowledges his sin before God and he's asking God for forgiveness. And the result in this verse is immediate and it's complete. It says, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So simple and yet so profound. God wipes the slate clean. Immediate, complete forgiveness. Praise God that this is how he welcomes people like us. So David gives a testimony of how God had forgiven him. 
And if, if you don't know how to talk to God, maybe you need to talk to somebody who's already been forgiven by God, who can help you. Just like David gives an example here. Maybe you need somebody who can help you to understand this reality, to walk through scripture with you, seek out someone. At our church, we have lots of people who would love to walk through these truths with you and explain to you how you can be forgiven from God. But then he goes on to, to explain the response to forgiveness. So we've seen the, the blessing of forgiveness and the experience of forgiveness in David's own life. And then we see the response to forgiveness. So he, he doesn't just want us to know this truth in an abstract way. He wants us to live differently because of this truth. So he says in verse six, therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. So there's a therefore, meaning, okay, there's a way you're supposed to live as a result. So he's explained the truth, and now here's what you should do because of it, which is you should pray to God. If, you want, if you're godly, meaning not that you are uh, sinless, obviously, because you need forgiveness, right, in, in this psalm. So w- what he's saying is, you have, you have a place in the covenant of God. You're one of his covenant people. You can pray to God. You can ask him to save you before the floods come, right? While there's still a chance. Pray to God, in other words, while you still can. As long as you have life and breath, you're able to cry out to God, but tomorrow is never guaranteed. So don't put this off. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. What an encouragement, right? Seek him while he may be found. But he wants to abundantly pardon you. He wants to have compassion on you. You know, we naturally tend to, to believe that we just have a ton of time, that we're going to live to a ripe old age, that we won't die. And we're so good at ignoring the obvious, which is that life is fragile. So don't wait to turn to God. Don't be foolish and think you can wait until tomorrow. Turn to God now. And then David shows us what those who are forgiven say in verse 7. He says, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. In the last psalm, in Psalm 31, God was a refuge from the enemies of the psalmist. But now he's a refuge from David's own sin. That's what God is. He's a refuge from a greater enemy. And this is incredible because the natural result of sin is that we would hide from God. That's what Adam and Eve did. That's what David was doing here in this psalm before he decides to to turn to God. The natural thing is to, to want a refuge from God, who is the judge of sin. And yet here, because of his forgiveness, God himself becomes the hiding place. The one we would think we'd be hiding from because he's just and holy. We can hide in him. We can be safe in him. God is our refuge from our greatest enemies. Look at verse eight. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curved with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Now, at this point in the psalm, it's not clear exactly who is speaking here. Some say it's God speaking. Some say it's David speaking. Others, and I think this is probably the right answer, is that there's someone who's a representative of God, maybe a priest who's speaking, and so he's kind of using the words of God. But we see at the end of the verse, he's calling them to praise God, so he's, he's not God. But just as there was a positive instruction of, okay, therefore, pray, confess, repent, here there's a negative instruction. And what's being said here is, don't be like a stubborn mule. Don't be like a horse. These are animals, horse and mule. They're animals that don't have any morality, don't have any any guidance. They don't know what is right or wrong. And in order for them to do the right thing or to work for their master, they have to be forced. They have to be coerced physically. David's saying, don't be like that. Don't be, don't be one who has to be forced into doing the right thing. Instead, do it from a willing heart. Learn, learn to follow God and to love and to obey him. Turn from your sin. Don't be foolish and turn to God who can forgive. 
be, uh, while there's while there's still an option. Don't be stubborn and foolish. And then in verse ten, he says, "Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord." Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. I love this. He's saying it's miserable to be wicked. Being wicked is a life of guilt and anxiety, and it's followed by eternal separation from God. And that's really key to all of this. If you are separated from God, you cannot possibly have blessing. You cannot possibly have joy, and you ultimately have no hope. And this shows us that forgiveness isn't simply about getting a second chance. Forgiveness is really, it's just a means to an end. And that end is that we would have God himself. Forgiveness is about getting God, about having a relationship with him, about knowing him and being a child of his and being close with him forever. So if you've been forgiven, you can rejoice because you have steadfast love surrounding you from God. You can, you can rejoice. You can shout for joy because you have what you need most of all, which is God. And if you have God, you need nothing else. This, this is such a fantastic psalm and it, it's quoted in the New Testament. Um, and so it's important for us to, to go to where it's quoted. It's quoted in Romans chapter four. And this is such an important passage as well. And, and it speaks so much to what's core to our faith. Romans four, verse four Paul says, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Oh man, I love this. So he he points again to this work of justification and this exchange that's given that our sins are covered. Our sins are done away with. They're not counted to our account anymore. They're not credited to us anymore. And instead we're credited with the righteousness of Christ. What that means is that Jesus, his righteous life is very important. Jesus lived every single moment of his life in perfect righteousness. He never once sinned. He did always exactly what God called him to do. And after all of those years, he laid his life down on the cross, taking our sin, but also giving to us, not simply some sort of vague righteousness or just a blank slate, but giving us his righteousness, that it's his deeds that are counted to our account. And so when God looks at us, he sees the perfect righteousness of Christ. He sees his perfect child and he treats us how Christ deserves. What an amazing, amazing truth that you've been given the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'll end with this quote from J.I. Packer. He says, adoption is the highest privilege of the gospel. The traitor is forgiven brought in for supper and given the family name. You can have forgiveness from God. I I hope that if you know that forgiveness, you'll rejoice in it today. And if you don't have that forgiveness, you'll stop everything until you have it, until you know you're forgiven and you're adopted as a child of God. Thanks so much for watching this video. We're uploading great biblical content every single week. So make sure you subscribe, like this video, and leave a comment down below. We'd love to discuss with you. If you want to support us financially, there's a link in the description of this video. Thanks so much.